next we have John Eltinge. He is the Associate Commissioner of Survey Methods, uh, for Survey Methods Research at the, Uf the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, his principal research interests include integration of multiple data sources, uh, classification and regression trees for complex data, small domain estimation and measurement error models. Uh, he received a PhD from the Department of Statistics at Iowa State University. Thank you for joining us. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Alan, and I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to speak here. This is the first chance I've had to attend a Wolfram Data Summit. Uh, it's been uh, very enlightening, enjoyed it a great deal, and uh, looking forward to further conversations. Um, in addition, I appreciate being placed at this point on the program because I've been uh, eagerly taking notes uh, with the previous presentations and saying, gee, I can tie it in here, tie it in here, and uh, like that. So it's nice to have a chance to pull together some of those threads. As the title indicates, I'm going to be talking about linking data quality with customer value. Um, and in particular, I'm going to be framing that through three main steps. First of all, we'll say a little bit about government statistical agencies. I work at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, but the experience I'll be describing are qualitatively similar to what many of our partner agencies like the Census Bureau, National Center for Health Statistics, and a number of other statistical agencies um, in, for example, Sweden, United Kingdom, and elsewhere in the world, uh, have also been experiencing, and in particular the experiences we've been having as we've started to wrestle with the question about the extent and ways in which we might be able to make productive use of big data to fulfill our mission in a way that's both cost effective and meets our other uh, criteria that we have. That in turn is going to lead into some discussion of linkage between the general notions of data quality that our agencies, and again based on the discussions we've been seeing here over the last couple of days, I believe also many of our other stakeholders and, and other people here in the room have been wrestling with in terms of formal definitions of data quality and linking that with specific ideas that we have about customer value and the value we deliver to particular data users and particular stakeholders in a given setting. And then we'll finish with a couple of really interesting examples that we've been wrestling with and, and that perhaps help to crystallize some of these ideas. One involves a so-called break in series. This is a major concern that statistical agencies have when they consider using alternative data sources and integrating into their production processes. And second, another major concern centers on disclosure limitations, some of the special challenges that arise when we think about using alternative data sources um, and the risk that may be incurred in that case. So we'll begin with a little bit of general uh, background. Now, overall, most government statistical agencies have a mission statement that in some fashion says the following. Our mission is to provide the public with high quality information on a sustainable and cost effective basis. And in a certain sense, I'll be spending the rest of the half hour here unpacking uh, that relatively short sentence because there's a lot of words uh, weighted with an awful lot there. Uh, to flesh that out a little bit, we'll start and say a little bit about our customers. Uh, we have certain key stakeholders, and in particular, some of our published data are uh, motivated primarily and were originally uh, mandated by Congress uh, for use by a particular stakeholder. Uh, so, for example, the Federal Reserve, uh, as you know, they had a meeting earlier this week. There was a lot of discussion of that. And when they talked, for example, about levels of prices, talked about employment levels uh, as well, some of the data that they're referring to are produced by the Bureau of Labor Statistics as well as a number of our partner agencies. Um, in addition to that, though, we have a very wide range of stakeholders whom we're also trying to serve uh, needs for. Uh, media is certainly one example of that. Students, both in terms of analysis of microdata and also students in terms of some or basic products like uh, the Occupational Outlook Handbook get a great deal of attention, as well as the general public. So we have a very wide range of stakeholders, and naturally they have a very different set of needs as we think about different stakeholders. With that, we have a wide range of corresponding uh, products uh, that we provide. Um, many of them are in the form of tabular publications. So for example, on the first Friday of every month, we put out an employment situation report, and the main component of that unemployment situation report is several sets of tables describing both household and business based measures of both employment and unemployment, both at the overall national level and also for specific levels uh, at the level of industry and occupation, uh, as well as some demographic information. In the same way, in the middle of each month, we produce a consumer price index. Again, you see a one headline number coming out of that, but there's also an awful lot of detail presented largely in tabular forms. We also have microdata releases um, in broad public dissemination. These are primarily in terms of household sur uh, survey data. Um, in addition, of that, we have microdata that are uh, made available uh, for individual researchers, either coming inside the walls of the Bureau of Labor Statistics in some case, or through our Federal Statistical System Research Data Center uh, structure. That's for others to analyze, and that tends to involve people who are interested in very in-depth analysis, usually involving either generalized linear models, hierarchical models, or other types of models with about that level of sophistication. Great deal of attention devoted in those cases to a very high level of conditioning. It's going to tie in with the notions of value that we have in a few minutes. Uh, in addition, we produce 
some analyses on our own. We have a mandate as to our partner agencies to be very strictly nonpartisan, both in terms of our data collection and in terms of our publication and, and discussion. Uh, so most of our analyses tend to be of a fairly technical nature, for example, work with seasonal adjustment and other types of work like that. We do do quite a bit of work uh, in that way, and that often informs both our current production as well as our, our prospective future production in a lot of areas. All of those products are generally characterized as, quote, public goods uh, in a sense that has been developed both for statistics but also for many other areas like national parks, roads, other things like that. Uh, in a literature that's developed over roughly the last 50 to 60 years at the interface between political science and economics. Very rich literature. I have some supplementary slides at the end if you're interested in more detail. But a couple of uh, four points I'll highlight for the moment in terms of public goods is we truly make this information available to a very broad public on an even handed basis, so-called level playing field. In addition, a fundamental feature of this is that we want these data to be used as widely as possible. So we very much have an open door in terms of that with some conditions and restrictions that I'll describe in a few minutes. Now historically, that mission and that set of products have been focused primarily on sample surveys and to some degree on analysis data related to administrative records um, as well. And in parallel with that, historically, both we and our partner agencies have had a wide range of quality measures that in some loose sense have been focused on something known as a total survey error model. I'll describe in a little bit more detail in a moment. Having said that, in the last eight to 10 years, there's been a great deal of attention devoted within the federal statistical system as well as our partner agencies overseas to looking at so-called big data like we've been hearing discussed here in the last day and a half. Uh, within the agencies and within the general survey community, this is also sometimes referred to as organic data. I personally prefer the term non-design data. It draws a distinction, helps to shed some light on characteristics that we see with these types of data relative to what we may have from traditional sample surveys or experiments. Other other people use a very broad term, organic data source, uh, excuse me, alternative data sources as well. Um, I'll give you four examples of that just to, to fix these a little bit in your mind. These are uh, ideas relevant to the BLS, but we have very similar phenomena, again, relevant to many of our partner agencies. One case is that we published the Consumer Price Index, as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, and there's a great deal of interest in, say, in studying the extent to which we may be able to obtain consumer price in index and uh, consumer price microdata from other sources than we currently collect. For example, retail scanners like you have with AC Nielsen or IRA, or particular uh, retailers uh, directly from them. Information in some cases that we collect through web scraping. We do a little bit of production work right now with web scraping, but in principle we could do a lot more. Uh, in addition, housing data um, presents some very rich opportunities for our consumer price index housing uh, series. Another example involves uh, employment counts from private payroll processors. Had an interesting discussion at lunch about this. Private payroll processors have information that they obtain from their clients as they process payroll information and in some cases also process benefit and other type of infra, um, uh, uh, work for um, uh, their customers. And in parallel with that, they have had, and in particular, a couple of uh, payroll processors, ADP as well as Paychex, are now publishing series related to that. ADP and Paychex cover somewhat different segments of the U.S. economy, and it's going to be very interesting to see the extent, if any, to which we can integrate um, that information with the production information that we have, either for overall aggregate estimates or possibly for particular sub-estimates that we have, for example, for specialized industries. Um, in addition, at present, the um, conference board uh, publishes a help wanted online index based on, quite literally, online pub, uh, postings of job um, uh, vacancies that are available. And this, again, what I was discussing with some of you at lunch, it's a fascinating phenomenon because it is quite literally an index related to postings, provides very valuable information, but does not necessarily say as much about the exact number of positions that are available associated with a particular posting. This is something we see frequently that we will see nuances as we look at these alternative data sources. And again, we've seen a number of variations on that in discussions that we've seen elsewhere um, earlier at this conference in which we have important elements available to us from some of these alternative data sources, but it doesn't tell us the full story. And a crucial question for us is to assess the extent to which that information is sufficient, provides enough value to our stakeholders, or whether we need to supplement that information in certain ways to provide all the information, the value that we need to provide to our customers. 
Another final example that was really interesting is Susan Woodward about a month ago uh, presented at the Joint Statistical Meetings a discussion of uh, some small business both employment and revenue data she had obtained from an online accounting uh, source and gave a very balanced and nuanced discussion there about both quality features, desirable features, as well as risks and uncertainties related to those data sources, a particular number of population coverage issues with that that were terribly important in terms of whether we'd be able to use those in production uh, at the Bureau of Labor Statistics or other agencies. With all of that and a whole lot of other discussion that we've had both again within BLS and many other agencies, We've identified a number of really crucial questions that we are exploring and will continue to explore, I'm sure, for quite a number of years. Um, the first one is, if in fact we use these alternative data sources, will we in fact provide equal or better value uh, for our customers? And this notion of value often um, ties in with the idea that Anthony uh, discussed earlier this afternoon related to decision elasticity. If in fact you didn't have these data or if you had them in a different form, to what what extent for certain key stakeholders or the general public would this end up affecting the ways in which they make decisions and essentially the quality of decision they make related to that? Can we understand that? As we dig into that further, we usually see an important distinction show up, which has uh, been discussed in a great deal of depth in the public goods literature previously. In some cases, we can evaluate this in terms of a concrete, very specific, quote, use value, unquote. An example of this is our consumer price index is used on an annual basis by the Social Security Administration to make a determination about whether all of our parents, grandparents, others who are receiving Social Security are in fact going to get an increase of how much for the next year in terms of their basic Social Security payment. In addition, the Consumer Price Index is embedded in a very large number of private sector contracts in the United States. We have negotiated a certain price for this year. Next year, it's going to be that plus whatever the Consumer Price Index went up for. In the same way, our producer price indices down at the individual product level are used very, very heavily, again, in a lot of contracts in the private sector. So that's an, those are examples of specific use cases, in some ways almost a mechanical use. We are going to plug this number in here, and as a result, we're going to get a particular outcome. There are also use cases that are slightly softer than that, but nonetheless pretty well focused. For example, many times we get inquiries from a chief economist or somebody else in an individual governor's office. They say, well, it's fine that you're producing national level information, but they're especially interested in estimates that we produce at their individual state level. And we say, okay, help us understand how you're using it. And they say, well, we are using your data in an econometric model because we have to give our governor a forecast of what the total revenue is going to be, total tax revenues are going to be for my state by the end of the fiscal year. If they get that wrong, they are going to have a very unhappy governor as well as a legislature. Furthermore, if they underestimate the revenue a little bit, then they maybe catch it and they end up having a little bit of extra money that the governor of the, uh, the uh, state legislature may be able to spend at the end of the year. For, on the other hand, states that have a balanced budget constitutional amendment, you must balance this budget by the end of the fiscal year. If, in fact, you have overestimated revenues and then halfway through the year, chief economist has to go back in and say, I know he told you that, but uh, you're going to have a very unhappy governor at that point. They have a very severely asymmetric loss function. It's a really good example of how value translates, doesn't necessarily translate in, in terms of traditional quality measures. We need to probe that further and understand how those quality measures tie in in a particular case for a particular set of users. In other cases, it's better characterized the use of our data and the value that we convey to our users is better conveyed as, quote, option value, unquote. General idea of option value is I am not necessarily using this particular benefit right now, but it sure is going to come in handy if I ever need to use it. Very simple example that's often cited in the literature is national parks. I personally have never been to Alaska. But the fact that there are some really nice parks up in Alaska conveys a certain value to me right now because someday I might use that. In parallel with that, many of our stakeholders, again, Federal Reserve, other users of our data, one of the reasons they are so interested in having certain data series and having a high degree of continuity, which I'll get into in a few minutes, is they say, we want to be able to have comparability of a large number of series. There may not be much going on in a certain sector of the economy right now, but if, in fact, we start seeing severe 
severe shocks in a particular part of the economy. We want to have a long base for comparison, give us much better context to understand what may be taking place at a given point. The same is true with an awful lot of methodological features like outlier detection, robustness, and other characteristics like that, tied in very closely with the notion of option value that we deliver. And a crucial question that our agencies then have is the ways in which we can extend traditional survey measures of data quality now that we're thinking about this wide range of non-designed or big data sources and do that in a way that is going to, in an enriched fashion, address the fundamental value questions that we have, the value we're delivering to our stakeholders. Say a little bit more about data quality, and in particular traditional survey ideas and then ways in which we ought to be able to extend those to think about these alternative data sources. Most of our traditional um, uh, survey agencies have a so-called multi-dimensional definition of data quality. And again, this ties in quite a bit with a number of comments that we've been hearing in the previous two days here. Uh, the six uh, to seven dimensions that we typically see cited are relevance, accuracy, timeliness, comparability, coherence, accessibility, transparency, and credibility. There will be an exam in a few minutes on those. Um, but in fact, those aren't just words. There really is a whole lot of content packed in each one of those. So I'm going to unpack that in the next few minutes. In particular, the fundamental question of relevance, if you try to explain that in a very broad, intuitive way, a uh, uh, good way to say that is, does this piece of that data or this broad set of data series that I have, does it shed light on my high priority decisions? Again, it goes back to the question of data elasticity that Anthony was raising uh, uh, earlier this afternoon. In a more formal sense, people who are as economists and statisticians will say, tell me about your variable specification, tell me about your model conditioning. That latter point is absolutely crucial, especially when you're thinking about very complex econometric modeling, which often is the most crucial part when you're thinking about trying to shed light on very complex uh, policy issues. Can't simply look at gross aggregates, you really have to look at very careful conditioning, again, usually captured through generalized linear models uh, or hierarchical models. Next component uh, is accuracy. And again, a quick intuitive way to say that is if the report says X, whatever X is, happens to be, equals 2.4, are you sure? How sure are you? Uh, in a formal sense, that ties in with the notion of bias and uh, mean squared error of point estimators, as well as if we ought to be slightly more refined, saying something about both the size and the coverage rate of interval estimates or other types of, of set estimator uh, procedures that we have. That final point is especially crucial when you have many stakeholders carrying out very rich, very complex forms of exploratory data analysis. Often you can get people reading way too much into a particular data set and having a sophisticated, refined understanding of these notions of inferential limitations in a complex data setting is really crucial. Being able to do that, first of all, for surveys is hard. Doing it for alternative data sources is going to be even more challenging. Really good opportunity. Another dimension, timeliness. Um, crucial question, when you're talking about timeliness, everybody wants things faster, but it's worthwhile to stop, step back and say, well, faster can often be more expensive, and it can also convey certain risks. We've seen a couple of references to that earlier uh, today. A crucial question to ask is, well, are you actually going to get a substantially better decision if you truly have faster data? And the answer naturally is depends. Um, and in particular, digging into that a little bit more formal way, you really need to understand a lot about the underlying rate of change in particular measures and in the associated decisions, if it were a policy decision or a decision by an individual private sector organization, for example, do I move into a market, do I not move into a market? What kind of time scales it attached to each of those decisions and the implementation and the resulting impact. All that's as crucial if we're going to be able to understand the value that we're conveying. And in particular, we will see that depending on the phenomena we're trying to measure, we have very different applicable time scales. In some cases, if you're talking about a hurricane that's about to make landfall, a few hours is crucial. Timeliness is absolutely essential uh, in many of those cases. In other cases, one example is epidemics. The Centers for Disease Control is focused largely in growth of epidemics in a matter of days on their scale. Um, and um, uh, that becomes crucial. In addition, on occasion, we see this in economic phenomena, and in particular, during the financial crisis in the autumn of 2008, when there were anecdotal reports, for example, about many small businesses getting their uh, lines of credit cut off by banks and things like that, it's something you could not necessarily wait to get perfect data in several months. You had to be able to work with whatever data you had available on a given basis. This ties back into the notion of option value. Most of the time for economic data, that time time scale may not matter, but on occasion, it really does matter.
Um, another example is involves infrastructure uh, investments. Uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, we have uh, at the Bureau of Labor Statistics published an Occupational Outlook Handbook. This is used very heavily by uh, students making decisions about what kind of career they might be interested in going into. And some related information captured through something known as the Occupational Employment Survey is often used by community colleges or other training type organizations to make a decision about should we in fact in our locality establish a new training program in Area X. That's something they're not going to flip a switch on overnight. And in terms of the impact on the well-being and employment prospects of individuals in their community, it's often a multi-year, in some case multi-decade, before they really see full fruits coming out of that. Very different time scale, and as a result of that different time scale in terms of the information we're providing to them. Comparability, uh, qualitative statement is, well, I want to be able to compare apples to apples, and that's fine as an intuitive qualitative statement, but often what we find is we have to dig further. To, so to extend that metaphor a little bit, we say I want to have some kind of apples to apples comparison. No, what I really mean, if I'm really parsing things very carefully, is I want to be able to compare red delicious with golden delicious apples, for example. Or maybe I'm slightly less rigorous, maybe I don't have quite that demand for precision. Uh, I, it's okay to compare compare apples to pears. Okay, they're about the same size and they have kind of the same texture. Or maybe I can compare apples and oranges. Okay, they're about the same size, but they're definitely not the same texture. Or maybe I can compare apples to raspberries. They're both fruit, right? That, in fact, is a good analogy and it's not frivolous. Because if we're counting jobs, all jobs for certain measurement purposes are the same. You're either employed or you're unemployed. In other cases, the uh, exact work, job requirements, for example, skill requirements, training, and other things like that really matter. So in some cases, you may be discussing the difference between a red delicious and a golden delicious. In other cases, you may be putting apples and raspberries together. Um, and so in a formal sense, we say we have to pay a lot of attention to the value that is going to be conveyed to our stakeholders by particular conceptual and measurement differences. Again, sometimes they're looking for only very coarse information. Other times, they're looking for very refined information. Uh, coherence uh, is another criteria. Rough, rough uh, idea is I've got a jigsaw puzzle or this piece is fitting together or are they in some ways just fundamentally different from each other and just don't fit together in an overall piece. Um, Alan Greenspan, when he was chair of the Federal Reserve, um, was absolutely famous for both in his congressional testimony and otherwise pulling the pieces together on the jigsaw puzzle from many disparate sources, some from federal government data series, from, from, from private sector series. It's a real tour de force to see him uh, provide testimony on television or otherwise uh, from that. In a formal sense, we can say what kind of context and interpretation do we need to have for specific practical uses? Again, that's where we're going to be able to convey value, is understanding what that need is. Accessibility, can I readily find and use the data that I need? We've seen several presentations on variations on that, both in terms of having accessibility and also ready capture and display of that type of information. Final one um, it involves uh, transparency and credibility. At a qualitative level, statements you hear are, I need to have all the cards on the table, I need to have a trusted third party source. That's especially important when our data are being used by two external parties, for example, in the type of contract uh, use of the consumer price index that I described before. For that purpose, they want to have information provided to them by an objective third party source. That's one of the reasons that BLS and our agencies spend so much time at present on a lot of work in presenting details related to survey methodology, and we will need to do exactly the same sort of thing in uh, further depth if we're going to be talking about integrating multiple data sources. That means in turn we need to understand an awful lot about that underlying data source that we are using, even if it's coming from a source that may be in some sense proprietary or otherwise subject to certain intellectual property restrictions. That's going to be a crucial thing because of this transparency and credibility issue. Okay. Finish with a couple of examples here. Uh, one example involves a break in series. When you talk to many people who are responsible for production at BLS or elsewhere, and you say, well, should we consider using alternative data sources? Like, again, the cases that I was describing before. The usual response I hear is, we have an open mind on it, but we need to be very cautious about, and then they specify a number of things. One of the concerns that they specify uh, very frequently and very legitimately involves a so-called break in series phenomenon. In a formal sense, that means that I have a certain estimator, call it theta hat. This might be, for example, for the unemployment rate of the consumer price index for a certain period T. We say, tell me about the difference between that estimate that you have and the underlying true value, whatever it happens to be. 
Are we going to induce, by changing our data sources or changing our use of our data sources, are we going to induce or experience a, quote, break in series, a change in the distribution, probability distribution, of that difference between truth and the estimate? Because we always know there's some degree of difference between there. That's a crucial question. There's a lot of literature on that in the survey world. It's something we're going to need to study a great deal um, in this alternative data source world also. The main focus has been on the level, essentially the bias and changing your bias structure. But in fact, we also need to pay a lot of attention. We're going to be delivering value to our stakeholders. Also tie that in with changes in variance. For example, we will often have a stakeholder who says, yeah, I'm mostly worried about bias. And then they pick up the phone and they call us and they say, gee, this series is suddenly jumping around a whole lot. Well, what are they saying? Gee, your variance seems to have gone up. Or they may say, most of the time things are OK, but it looks like on occasion things are way out of line. Essentially, they're worried about an outlier and, in fact, whether we have a sufficiently rigorous pattern uh, of work for outlier detection. Same is true for seasonality. Some of you are aware there's been a lot of discussion, especially uh, for some of our partner agencies, about seasonality patterns and how they have been changing, uh, largely in, in possibly in response uh, to the Great Recession. Um, um, often when you dig further into that and you think about a break in series that may be induced uh, through the use of an alternative data source, crucial question is what do we know about that data source and have certain quality characteristics of that underlying microdata source changed in a way that may be undetected or not detected in a timely way? For example, if you have an alternative data source that's based on commercial activity, has the customer base changed? For example, you may have had a provider that previously was focusing on relatively large businesses. Now they're moving and focusing on a mix of large and small or vice versa. We'd like to know that. In fact, we more than like to know it. We really need to know that because it may have an effect on this break in series phenomenon. Uh, and we need to be able to catch that ahead of time. Um, also, very frequently when we have auxiliary information, as I mentioned at the start of the talk, we get some but not necessarily all of the information we need, and consequently we need to be able to link that at a microdata level. In doing that, in many cases, we need to have an informed consent to link it by the person who's providing us with these data, and in fact, that is not something we can compel. All but one of our BLS surveys are voluntary in nature. Our field force absolutely moves heaven and earth to get a high degree of cooperation, but we cannot compel that type of cooperation, nor can we compel consent. And so very frequently when we think about integrating multiple data sources, we have to do an enormous amount of modeling for a whole lot of reasons. And as a result of that, we need to evaluate the quality of that model fit, and in particular, keep a careful eye on that, because underlying features of the data may change um, in terms of, again, both the source and the measurement procedures that we have. And so we need to pay very careful attention to the quality of the model fit as well. Any one of those can cause the kind of break in series phenomenon that we have. Um, in addition, I'll mention very briefly that um, if we then think about how do we design a system that is truly robust, against these types of shocks like a break in series or otherwise. One crucial approach is to think about designs um, in a quote fault tolerant way. The general notion of fault tolerant designs was developed originally in computer science and engineering. I believe many of you are familiar with that. That's something that only on the very edges has begun to filter into the sample survey and the government statistics community, but something we need to be paying an awful lot of attention to because in fact the more we can make a design fault tolerant in particular, tune certain fault tolerance characteristics very directly to the types of value or the components of value that are most important for our customers. It's going to be really crucial for us to do that. Um, in addition, have a second example involving disclosure limitation. Um, and I'll just say a couple of words about this. This is reporting on some uh, work by a couple of my colleagues at the BLS, Erica Yu and Daniel Toth. In particular, the BLS Quarterly Census of Employment and Wages uh, is an administrative record data source. Uh, since the 1940s, we have been producing these series, both for the national level est uh, estimates involving basically employment levels as well as uh, aggregate wages. But there's also very strong stakeholder interest in fine-grained data down at a relatively fine level of aggregation involving intersections of industry by particular geographical areas, state or metro area, or in some cases, individual counties. Fundamental problem is that if you're going down to that very fine level of aggregation, you can have very important issues related to disclosure limitation. There are very serious legal questions related to that. And as a result of that, we find ourselves in a conundrum of having one or two options that we need to pursue. 
Uh, at present, when we have a cell that is problematic from that disclosure point of view, we end up being required simply to suppress it. An alternative that we and our partner agencies are exploring uh, is to, quote, add noise, unquote, to those data, which means you effectively take whatever the true value is, you can't release that for the disclosure reason I had, and so you essentially add a certain amount of noise on top of that. Good news is you can produce something, the bad news is somebody looks at that and says, but that's not the real data. And so it's a very tough trade-off and trying to understand, this is what Erica, uh, you and Daniel Toth have been doing, is try to understand and explore with our stakeholders what those trade-offs are and in particular what particular cases they say I'm willing to take some added noise in order to get something published for that particular cell. Crucial ideas behind that is to look at particular use cases. If you ask them a general abstract question, uh, generally you don't get a lot of traction. But give them specific use cases, ask them how exactly are those data used, and what exactly is the impact of either suppressing that cell, we're not gonna give it to you at all, or giving that cell information, but with some added noise on top of that. So in conclusion, uh, we're very excited about the discussion of use of big data or non-design data for official statistics. I believe it's part of a very broad and deep societal reconsideration of statistical information. It's been going on for several years. I believe it's going to be going on for several more decades. Um, involves a wide range of issues regarding expectation on quality, cost, risk, as well as stakeholder utility. A lot of attention is going to have to be devoted to taking the tools we currently have and extending them. That's why it's so exciting to be here and learn about the tools that everybody else here is using as well. And also related questions of resource allocation. And in particular, it's very important that we think a lot about extending measures that we have of data quality and tying that in with notions of stakeholder value that we're delivering, both in terms of use value and in terms of option value. Thank you. <laughs>